We will now talk about comparing two categorical variables. We will first focus on the data summary method referred to as the contingency table. For this example, we will start with a 3 by 2 table, meaning there are three rows and two columns. In the columns, we will keep track of voting patterns or voting habits. In particular, what we have is information on whether or not the people polled voted in the last election or not. We have those that said yes, they did vote in the last election, and we have those that said no, they did not vote in the last election. This is clearly a categorical variable, no numbers. In fact, it is a dichotomous variable having only two options. It is best to think of this as a nominal variable, as there is no inherent order in how we might rank yes or no. While it is common that we might assign the number 1 to yes and 0 to no, that is completely arbitrary. In the rows, we will keep track of the political party. There are three options, those identifying as Republicans, those identifying themselves as Democrats, and those identifying as Independents. Next, we would record in this table numbers, and these numbers would represent how many people we observed who fell into each of these categories. The idea is that any one person will have a value for each of these variables. They will have a voting pattern response, yes or no, and they will have a political party response, Republican, Democrat, or Independent. Again, there are two variables. The variable is voting pattern, and the values are yes or no. The variable is political party, with the values Republican, Democrat, or Independent. That is not to suggest there aren't other political parties, but in this sample, these are the only three that were observed. One of the interactive textbook problems that commonly gives students trouble is demo number 6-2. This question presents the summary of the data as a contingency table and asks students to reconstruct a possible example of what the raw data might have looked like. If we were to do that here, our raw data would have two columns, one for each variable, and the number of rows would be the total sample size, which would be the sum of the frequencies in this contingency table. Here's an example of what the top of the raw data set might look like, say in the first few rows of the first two columns of an Excel sheet. One key point to note is that when you have data summarized in this format in a contingency table, it is just that. It is a summary report. It is not the actual data, or more specifically, it is not the raw data. The two columns to the right is what the raw data might look like. The data is often confused with this summary report. The raw data would have a column for how each person responded on the voting pattern and a separate column for how each person responded on political party. As you are in the process of collecting and recording the data, you are attending to just one row at a time and you simply mark yes or no in the first column and then in the second column you mark either Republican, Democrat, or Independent. Once you have this raw data, then you count how frequently a particular pairing of the data appeared, for example, no and Republican. And this is the value you would record in the contingency table to the left. So, if there were only three people that indicated they were Republican and did not vote, there would be a three in that cell of the contingency table. And then, in the entire set of data, there would be three and only three rows in the raw data with the pattern no in the first column and Republican in the second column. Let's now fill in the values for our hypothetical example. For this observational study, we had 140 Republicans indicating they did vote in the last election and 70 who had not voted. There were 180 Democrats who said they voted and 60 who did not. Lastly, there were 80 independents that were polled who said they had voted, and then there were 20 independents who said they had not voted. And this is the data that we will use for the remainder of our discussion here. Now we will introduce the concept of the marginal distribution. In any contingency table, one of the things we can talk about is the marginal distribution. Essentially, what we are going to do is pretend for a moment that there is actually only one variable in our data set. For example, if I pretend that the only variable for which I had data was the voting pattern, then what I would do is ignore the fact that I have additional information about the political party and I would imagine collapsing all of the rows. That is, I would add up each column for a total of 400 people responding, saying that they had indeed voted. And if I look at everyone who didn't vote, 70 plus 60 is 130 plus 20 is 150, there were 150 people who indicated they hadn't voted. The marginal distribution, i.e. the marginal frequencies, gets its name from the fact that the information is often recorded in the margin of the table. So if I'm asking for the totals for the voting patterns, there were 400 yeses and 150 noes. I could alternatively do the same thing for each row, 
by collapsing across columns. This would give a total column. In this case, the total column reports how many of each political party there were, i.e. ignoring whether they voted or not. In this case, there were 210 Republicans responding. There were a total of 240 Democrats in this survey and 100 independents responded. Note, if I add up the total column or the total row, I'm going to get the same value of 550. This is good, and this is the total sample size for our scenario here. To clarify, this is the marginal distribution for voting patterns, the last row in the margin, and the row totals in the final column gives us the marginal distribution for political party. We will now move to the idea of odds and probabilities. We will continue to talk about marginal distributions and marginal frequencies, but the focus now will be on marginal odds and the marginal probabilities, which is sometimes called marginal risk. The guiding question for this next discussion is, what are the odds for voting? But note, this conventional statement is more formally asking, what are the odds of voting compared to not voting? In this case, the odds would be 400 to 150. And that is the way odds are normally stated. A number for the first event, the preposition to, and the number for the opposite event. 400 individuals indicated they voted compared to 150 who indicated they didn't. The mathematical representation of this can be to separate the numbers with a colon, or it can be represented as a fraction. Just as with fractions, it is possible to reduce the ratio. For example, 400 to 150 can be reduced to 8 to 3. Note, as fractions, these two ratios are equivalent. We could say that for every eight people who voted, there were three people that did not vote. As a fraction, this is eight-thirds, which with rounding is about 2.67. So we could say the odds are 2.67 to 1 for having voted. Or we could position the 1 at the start of the ratio and say the odds are 1 to 0 0.375 for having voted. Next, we discuss the probability of voting more specifically, the marginal probability of voting. This time we will ask the question, what is the probability of voting? The probability is best written as a fraction of the frequency of our event, voting, happening divided by the total frequency. There were 400 people that voted, and we will divide this by the entire sample, which we know to be 550, to emphasize that this is 400 plus 150 for the total number of survey participants. Notice, these are the same individual values that appeared in the odds, 400 and 150. So if I was given the odds and I wanted to convert it to a probability, I would divide the value I'm interested in by the sum of the values appearing in the odds. So 400 divided by 550, if we were to reduce this fraction, it would be the same thing as 8 over 11, which turns out to be 0.727 or about 72.7%. So the probability of randomly selecting a person from this survey who voted, assuming all participants are equally likely to be chosen, is 72.7%. We will now move from the marginal distribution to the idea of the conditional distribution. Recall, the marginal distribution gets its name from the fact that the information is usually found in the margins of the table. For example, collapsing all the columns into one column, thus giving us the marginal distribution for each row or collapsing all the rows into one row to get the marginal frequencies for the columns. Whereas the marginal distribution, as is if we are ignoring the fact that we have information on an additional variable, the conditional distribution is as if we are temporarily restricting our attention to only one value of that previously ignored variable. Said again, in a marginal distribution, we collapse all the unwanted values of the secondary variable into one. In a conditional distribution, we focus on one particular value from that other variable. So now we want to come up with the conditional probabilities, aka the conditional distributions. We will start by redrawing our 3 by 2 table. What we are doing when we talk about a conditional distribution is that we want to figure out what percentage of people voted compared to those who didn't. But in a conditional distribution, we are going to limit our attention to a subset of the total data. In particular, we will attend only to those that indicated they were Republican. We've limited our attention to one value or range of values out of the possible values for that variable, in this case, political party. Again, we will start by limiting our attention only to individuals that identified as Republican. I know that there were 140 who voted out of the total 210 Republicans that responded. And that turns out to be 0.66666, or about 66.7%. For the moment, I'm pretending this subset of 210 is my only data, i.e., 
I've conditioned on the fact that I know that I'm talking about a Republican. So if this is my only data, then the percentage of voting would be 140 out of the total, which is 210. Likewise, I could take 70 out of 210 and get the conditional percentage for having not voted. But we kind of knew that it would have to be this, as the percentages in this row would have to add up to 100%. To reiterate, the idea here is that we are attending only to Republicans in the calculation in this row. I could do the same thing attending only to the Democrats. If I look only at the Democrats, then I have 180 out of 240, not 210 as above, because here I'm looking at only Democrats as opposed to Republicans above. 180 over 240 is 75%, thus there would have been 25% of the Democrats indicating having not voted. Last but not least, we can do the same thing for the independents. We know there are 80 out of the total 100 independents that indicated that they voted. That's 80% which means that there were 20% of the independents that did not vote. Now, if I look at the marginal probabilities, I can see that for the total, we knew there were 72.7% of the total sample that voted, and there were 27.3% of the entire sample that had not voted. To emphasize, these are the marginal probabilities, and each row above represents its own conditional probability distribution. Again, if I'm conditioning on the fact that I'm talking only about independents, then I focus only on the last row, the conditional probabilities in the last row. Let's talk briefly about the idea of independence. Just a reminder, this is a course on statistics, not a course on probability. While we use techniques from probability, I do not intend to spend a large amount of time on topics from probability, and independence is one such topic. In brief, the idea of independence is about asking this question. Do the conditional probabilities match the marginal probabilities? In other words, do the probabilities in any one column all match the marginal probability from the last row, the row with the marginal totals? Now, what does this mean if they are the same? Well, if all the probabilities for having voted are the same, then this suggests that the probability of having voted has no relationship to whether I was a Republican, Democrat, or Independent. Then we can argue that there is no relationship between voting patterns and political party affiliation. If there is no relationship, i.e. if the variables are independent, then this suggests that conditional probabilities would all be the same and they would all be equal to the marginal probabilities. Said another way, is A related to B, where A is the voting pattern and B is the political party? If there is no relationship, then the variables are independent, and this would suggest that the conditional probabilities equal the marginal probabilities. The way this is tested in a statistical setting is with the use of the chi-square test of independence. I'll put this on the radar for those of you who think you might encounter this in your future studies, but we won't be talking about it right now. One question that you might have is about why did we divide by 210, 240, and 100? You might ask, couldn't we have divided all the numerators by 400? In other words, why did we divide by the total for the parties and not the total for the voting habits? The answer is, it could have been. In fact, if we wanted to report the conditional probabilities for voting pattern instead of by political party, this is the approach we would need to take. In our example, we conditioned on the political party, so in each calculation we focused on one row and treated that as the entire data set for the moment. If we were to have conditioned on the voting pattern, for example, working only with those that indicated they had voted, we would have focused our attention only on one column at a time and conditioning on whether you voted or not would allow us to explore what is the probability of being in one party versus another depending on whether you voted or not. We will now talk about conditional odds. We must be careful because the language for these can become a bit cumbersome. What are the odds for having voted for independence? Or, said another way, what are the odds for having voted conditioned on the fact that we know we are talking about someone who reported being an independent? What we want to emphasize is that whenever we are talking about odds, there is the thing in which we are interested versus the opposite of that thing. So in this case, we have the odds for voting versus not having voted. The next piece of information we need is the condition. In our example, our condition is the fact we are looking only at independence. So focusing only on the information about independence, there were 80 that voted and there were 20 that didn't vote. So the odds in this case are 4 to 1. Written as a fraction, this is 80 over 20, 4 over 1, or, or just the number 4. The way we would state our final answer, or final conclusion, is 
you are four times more likely to vote than not if you are independent. Or, in more common parlance, the odds of voting for independence are four to one. Now let's do the same thing for conditional probabilities. Questions about conditional probabilities often take the form of something like, what is the conditional probability of voting for independence? Once again, we very clearly have a condition. We are focusing only on independence. Thus, we are talking about a conditional probability. The calculation runs a little differently. Instead of 80 compared to 20, we have 80 over the total, which is 80 plus 20, or 100, which gives us 80%. This would be put into words by saying something along the lines of the conditional probability for voting for independence was 80%. However, a more colloquial presentation of this fact would be to say that 4 out of 5 independents voted. Recall, previously, we say that 4 independents voted to every 1 that didn't. Here we say that 4 out of 5 independents voted. So the key words or phrases you want to look out for when you are distinguishing between odds versus probabilities. Odds use the preposition to, and probabilities use the preposition out of. As an abstract example, we may have been given the probability 3 out of 10, and we may have been given the odds 3 to 10. It is important to realize that these are not the same thing. They do not equal each other. 3 out of 10 as an odd statement would be 3 to 7, whereas 3 to 10 as a probability statement would be 3 over 13. Here is the end of class question for this segment. Please tell me, what are the conditional odds of voting for Democrats? Again, what are the conditional odds of voting for Democrats? Please feel free to pause the video here while you complete this. Next, we will discuss odds ratios. Here's a type of question you might encounter. What is the odds ratios of having voted for Republican responders compared to independent responders? This is the type of question you will encounter with an odds ratio query. There is something that we are interested in, and here it is whether people voted or not, and we want to compare two distinct groups. The first group are the Republicans, and the second group is the Independents. Let's first focus just on the Republicans. For the Republicans, here is the information I have on the odds for voting for the Republicans. I know there were 140 Republicans that had voted, and that would be compared to the 70 Republicans who didn't vote. This would be expressed as 140 over 70. These are the odds for having voted for Republicans. I will now do the same calculation for the independents. For the independents, I know there was a total of 80 independents who voted, and that is compared to the 20 independents who didn't vote. This gives us the odds of 80 over 20. Now we have the odds of 140 over 70, which is 2, over the odds of 80 over 20, which is 4. When I divide these odds, this gives me the odds ratio. The odds ratio needs something on which we are focusing, and then two groups that are being compared. When we do the arithmetic, we get the value 2 to 1 over 4 to 1, which is 1 half, or 50%. One way to present the answer here is as the odds for Republicans voting for half the odds for independents voting. First thing to note is that an odds ratio inherently compares two conditional odds. For this process, we need three specific things. In our calculation, it is imperative we identify these three things. First, we have a focal group. For our scenario, that was the Republicans, and this is the group that appears in the numerator. Next, we need a comparison group. In this case, that was the independents. This is the group appearing in the denominator. Then, most importantly, we need some result or outcome or activity of interest. In this case, it was having voted. If you start by clarifying these three things when doing an odds ratio problem, then you shouldn't encounter too many issues when doing the calculations. Though it is not explored in detail here, the same three concepts, focal group, comparison group, and result of interest, show up in doing relative risk calculations. Relative risk calculations mirror odds ratio calculations, but instead of taking the ratio of two odds, you take the ratio of two probabilities. There is more on this in the demos for this module on WAMAP. Here is the next end of class question. What is the odds ratio for not having voted for independents compared to Democrats? Again, what is the odds ratio for not having voted for independents compared to Democrats? Thank you for your attention.